I just want to thank Santa Cruz for coming out in such a huge way for um, We Are Still Here in this movie today. Thank you so much for coming out. And I met Anne Marie Sayers four years ago at a gathering in Hollister. She spoke about the government of California funding the extermination of her people. She spoke about land grabbing and the erasure of native Californians' rights and existence on the Central Coast. I remember at that meeting feeling two really powerful emotions. One was shame, and the other was hope. And how could I have not known about Anne Marie Sayers, who lives literally an hour and a half away? Um, but the other part of it was when Anne Marie spoke and welcomed us onto the land, she radiated a kind of joy and inspiration that was based on a deep knowledge of who she was and what she represented. It made me want to know more about her life, Native Californians, the land and the land she protects. So now I want to invite the talented activist, artist, and educator Canyon Sayers Roots to share the grandmother's song with us and welcome us onto the land. Canyon is Costanoan Ohlone Woodson in Chumash. She also goes by her native name, Coyote Woman. She is a poet, published author, graphic designer, student, and teacher. The daughter of Anne Marie Sayers, she was raised in Indian Canyon. Her art has been featured at the De Young Museum, the Somarts Gallery, Gathering Tribes, Snag Magazine, and numerous powwows and indigenous gatherings. I want to say thank you so very much for the beautiful introduction. Mishmi Tulis, Conrad Canyon, Coyote Woman, Sayers Roots. I come from Indian Canyon Nation, the only federally recognized Indian country between Sonoma and Santa Barbara along Central Coastal California. I recognize that I am a privileged indigenous youth who is able to say that she has been raised in a, in, in a traditional and intertribal community space where my ancestors have always been from where I could say my grandmothers, 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 grandmothers have always been from. We share this time and space together for a reason. So it's with that humility, that gratitude, that present mindedness that I offer this song in the space here. Can you grab another song? start by saying that as we gather here in the homelands of Ohlone people, um, I want to acknowledge the first peoples on whose beautiful lands we're on. And I also want to thank my indigenous mentors and teachers in my motherland in India, as well as my indigenous teachers here, who have really greatly informed my photojournalism and my storytelling. And thank you to the Museum of Art and History for opening up this space and the Community Foundation of Santa Cruz for supporting us as well. So I want to share uh, my personal story on what inspired me to make my first documentary short in the land of my ancestors. So I'm born and raised in India. 
and I'm given to understand that Christopher Columbus was looking for my people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Indians from the Indian subcontinent. <laughs> but Columbus got lost by a thousand miles, <laughs> just missed the mark, and then he got lost ethically, spiritually, and morally. And this film really celebrates the resilience and the resistance of indigenous women across the Turtle Island who really, really are, have been on the front lines for 500 years trying to fix this colonial crisis. So let's just give a shout out to all the indigenous women. So as a photojournalist, I'm drawn to narratives, how stories are framed, how agendas are set, and the gatekeepers that control the narrative to the advantage of the dominant culture. In this case, a very Eurocentric, a very ethnocentric culture. And um, as a South Asian woman and an immigrant here, I'm really drawn to stories of counter narratives of women of color who are really flipping the script, flipping the script of dehumanization, because we really are living in an age of peak dehumanization right now. This is not an old story, this has been a continuum. Um, and I feel that it's really important to shine the light on these women's voices and stories and how they are debunking the dominant narrative to reclaiming their stories, reclaiming their histories and the historical timelines. There's a lot that I have internalized as an immigrant because there's a strong assimilation narrative for us immigrants, you know, to assimilate and sort of cater to the dominant culture. Most importantly, I wanted to make a film that really celebrated her resiliency. Too often we have seen stories of victimization, um, patronizing ways in which stories are told about women specifically. My hope with this film is that we can have a conversation on how we can just learn to listen, listen and learn from the leadership of indigenous women right here. You know, We are living in a state of constant crisis, this negative sensationalistic coverage. And I think that is the design. The design is to create a sense of hopelessness so they can be an interventionist threat. There's so much hope you know, in the dark, especially with young people who have been really rising up to the challenge um, and talking about climate justice. And the question that I ask myself as someone who's not from here is, before we think about the solutions and the future, can we actually pay attention to how did we get to this mess? You know, did wildfires just come out of nowhere last year? Right. What was the process that led to the devastation in the first place? Can we recognize it? Can we name it? Anne-Marie once said that when you take something from nature, you ask for permission, and then you say thank you. Those of us who have lived in Omanoni territory, some of us have taken a lot, have received a lot. So can we explore a conversation of, on what it means to give back? So we're going to watch the film, and then the woman of the hour. Mm -hmm. We get to talk to her. My name is Anne Marie Sayers. I live in Indian Canyon in Hollister, California, and it is the only federally recognized Indian country for 350 miles along coastal California. This is a lonely territory which extends from San Francisco to a Big Sur, from the Pacific Ocean to the Mount Diablo Range. It was not until 1980 that I realized the American Indian did not get the right to practice their religion freely until 1978 with the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. I was horribly upset. And so I opened up my great grandfather's trust allotment to all indigenous people who are in need of traditional lands for ceremony. California, indeed, is a golden state. Reality dictates that the foundation of California, foundation of this entire country, is built on lies and death of Indians. I will tell you, my ancestors lived here for 15, 16,000 years. And it's at a point now that our mother is having difficulty. Not
non-Native people can learn a lot from the Native peoples that are still alive, that are still living on their lands, that are working with the environment in a manner that is respectful. I would really enjoy the current administration to live on a reservation. And perhaps they would understand what they are creating and what they have created. And understand the beauty of natural life. Let's check it. I love being alive today. And seeing all the Native people really embrace their culture. Give the old warmest claps to Anne Marie Sears. Pretty nose sucks. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I'm a cancer survivor. Between ceremonies, prayers, and Western medicine, collectively, it works. But I'm still a bit unbalanced. But I, I see the improvement, so forgive me if I kind of stumble, stumble along. And so much of your work, Anne-Marie, is reshaping a reality, and a false reality, and writing what's wrong. Um, can you talk a little bit about your, your, your devotion to this quest for truth and history? Just tell us a little bit about that. I believe all lenses should be shared. And I can recall when I was in the third grade, there was two pages about California Indians in history in the textbook. And on the second or third paragraph, it said, the Indians were very lazy here. Uh, I just said, that is not the case at all. My mother was not lazy. I mean, it, and it was from that time that different Native peoples that would come up from, to the canyon when my mother was alive and I was a child, uh, that we would partake in the singing ceremony, and it was so beautiful. I, just, I was just a part of. But when Canyon came home and told me, Mom, a boy in school told me that if I was Indian, I was dead. And I said, that's basically what started. I want to see truth in history about the original people on whose land we are on. Before I came in here, I offered tobacco. And I just asked, I said, ancestors on whose land I am on, please guide me so that my words, my actions will honor you the ancestors on whose land I am on. And I do that just about every place I go. And when I don't take the time to do it, something will happen that will remind me. <laughs> but um, I am one of the luckiest mothers in the world. My daughter, she has her <clears throat> BS in... Would, would you, Web design and interactive media from the Art Institute, for-profit private institutions. <laughs> and she is so entrenched in her culture. It's absolutely incredible. And I love it, because I know it will continue. So I am true. I'm living my dream. Woo. I, re I really am. Um, I have a question. Um, we're living in really quite the time right now. I mean, I'm from India. There's so much unfolding that it's very upsetting. Right here in the U.S., Brazil. Um, I, so many of us are feeling a little disenchanted, um, a little confused and distracted. Uh, what advice would you offer to us? NDD is a legitimate mental disorder. And that is nature deficit disorder. Yeah. And when you connect with nature, 
at times you have to really go out of your way, but when you do, there's nothing like it. You realize how unimportant we really are. And, and we're just a little tiny speck. But collectively, together, we can make things happen. And that is educating people. I know when um, the students that was in this film, uh, they're from York, York School in Monterey, and I share with them, when you pick the mugwort, because a lot of people catch poison oak, and mugwort grows right beside poison oak. And you take that mugwort and just squash it up into a little water and then rub it where the poison oak is, it, the likelihood of it removing the majority of poison oak oil is, is really pretty high. And so I said, but before you pick the mugwort, you say, you acknowledge the plant, you say thank you for its medicinal properties, and then you go forward. And there's a lot of people that don't think that way. I did not realize that, because it's all I have ever known. Same with canyon. Just taking the time to listen to the water and let the water tell you. Taking the time to listen to the wind and, and see what thought went through this tree over to this th tree that connected, connected with you. That's the way spirit works. Just taking the time to listen, to listen and hear what is being said. Does that kind of answer your question? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Much more. I'm going to ask a last question, and then we want to open it up to everyone. Um, this this idea of listening, and this idea of paying attention and deep listening. Uh, so many people who watch the film on KQB, screen it on KQBD last week. <laughs> okay. Okay. And she did a great job. What advice would you have to non-Indigenous people in terms of, you know, this idea of the thing and being allies and then moving forward? Just getting out there. I mean, you can Google California Indian, you can Google Indian Canyon, you can Google uh, September 28th, <laughs> Indian Canyon storytelling event. And <laughs> One o'clock is on. One o'clock, yeah, it's on a Saturday. And, and um, make that extra effort. Just make the extra extra effort to get out there and do it. Do what? What do we do? Do what? <laughs> Honor, truth, and history. Oh, yeah. Honor, truth, and history. Um, come visit me. <laughs> Does anybody have a question for Anne-Marie? I would like to believe that most everywhere that I am is sacred. And I would like to believe that there is a way for me to be in touch with that without having to go <coughs> to a place. I, I understand the spirit of retreat, especially going to a place, being with, with people that can teach me and that, that, that I can find a, a, a way to renew myself. But I would like to believe that there is a way for me to connect with nature, with spirit, wherever I am. Could you just speak about that a little bit? Our Mother Earth is very sacred. It really, really is. And we haven't been taken care of her. Our society is so absent of the sacred, outside of perhaps money. Uh -huh. And, and so it's people like you that are very, very supportive, educating other people. And I, I found that regardless of where you may be, yes, you can communicate with all the life that surrounds you. I can recall taking Canyon to school and I said, oh, look at the ferns. They're waving you by. Wow. And she said, sure, Mom. <laughs> sure, Mom. And then she saw them wave one time. I never got that sure, Mom again. <laughs> yes. 
Um, can you speak a little bit more about the significance of being the only federally recognized uh, piece of property, given that the coastal of California was the most highly populated when white colonists came in and destroyed? 50% uh, of California Indians are not federally recognized tribally. But there were a number in 1911, President Taft uh, signed an individual trust allotment to my great grandfather, and of which my brother and I inherited. And then I, from 1980 to 1988, I wanted to build my great grandfather's home site. Well, that property was 300 feet away from his original trust land, so. It fell under the jurisdiction of the Bureau of Land Management, and we, we utilized the Indian Allotment Act of 1887. It was eight years of jumping through hoops for this government. Uh, we had less than 3% chance of being successful, and we did it, with the help of a lot of people. With the increasing number of uh, wildfires that we're having in California, what can we learn? from Native American culture about how to deal with books. In 1955, I believe, there was a book came out of um, fire management by the original people, by the Native Americans, and no, no one was interested in publishing it. Uh -huh. But I found that uh, it did come out a couple of years ago, and, and you learn, after thousands of years, you learn how to take care of it. And so, uh, I, would, I, I can't remember the name of the author. Kat Anderson, Tending the Wild, as well as, if you go to my website, Canyon Consulting, both with K's, because in our language, C's are pronounced ch, and our K's are k, and my name begins with K, so it's canyonconsulting.com. I have a list of book recommendations that are also encouraged by indigenous educators. So it's my goal to someday get a bit more capacity to edit this list to ensure that there's extra commentary around why some of these might be recommended or should be considered. Because one book that's out there, I appreciate and respect and have a lot of admiration for Malcolm Margolin. However, I recognize when he first wrote The Ohlone Way, he never talked to any Ohlone people. So when we think about that, I'm not going to... I might have a certain type of feeling about when or how he made the book, and of course where he cited his sources, because if he didn't know that they didn't exist, and then the cited sources are of a potentially affluent, I quite possibly patriarchal, heteronormative narrative that's non-indigenous. We think about these cited sources and these cited sources and these cited sources, that's where the word alone came from, because it was a village site named Ojolón. And the same thing where Costa Noan came from, Costa Años, where the Spaniards thought they ran into coastal Indians. So they never actually engage in consent culture, seeking how do you identify? No, no investment at all. So through honoring truth and history, by recognizing the diverse lenses, by celebrating our diversity, and coming together in unity within our community, we can be better stewards of the land. And so with that, I just want to say thinking about how we can honor the land that we're on and consider how our actions and decisions will impact the next seven generations is a necessity. Oh, thank you. Oh. Isn't she good? Yes, she is. When we read books, it says Native Americans, hunter-gatherer communities. That is erasing indigenous science. That's erasing indigenous technology. That's erasing navigation by the stars and understanding environmentalism understand the father of permaculture. <laughs> yes, permaculture today has never been all the things put together at the unique timing of the amount of people that have been a part of it. However, permaculture is fundamentally gathering all the amazing wisdoms of the indigenous nations and bringing it together and applying it in the today. So when we are coming together with doing these things, we need to recognize that there's history and knowledge and connections that's deeper and in such, from such an amazing wealth. But our priorities and how we offer and convey these messages is very troubling. And so this next generation, like many of our generations, have been waking up. Leonard Peltier is still in prison. 
And it's so very important that we recognize that many indigenous peoples have been imprisoned for protecting the earth, for protecting their community, for standing for what's right. He did not commit the crime that he was accused of, but because it would look so ugly for the government to actually acknowledge they messed up, they're choosing to keep him in. But another person I thought of was Danusha Lamaris, who's our current poet laureate of Santa Cruz County. I don't know if you know of her. And she's been published in um, the Best American Poetry, the American Poetry Review, the New York Times Magazine, New Letters, Plowshares, the Gettysburg Review, The Sun, and Tin House. Danusha, can I Thank you. I am really honored to be here and to be a part of this. I'm really grateful um, to show up and share, I guess, some of how I pray. It occurs to me that we live in a time where there's a very strong overstory of what's happening in our culture. And it's what we see when we connect to the news and things like that. That's the overstory. And I, I just feel so strongly that what's going on even more powerfully is what's happening in the understory. And that there's a place of intense potential for transformation right now. And we're all part of the understory right now, where something very different is happening um, than in that overstory. So I just want to acknowledge that and to, I guess, put out the feeling of hope that can come with that. that there's a movement, and it's all of us connecting to each other and to this world. I want to share a poem I wrote called Stone. And what am I doing here, on the side of the hill, at the ragged edge of the tree line, sheltered by conifer and bay, watching the wind lift softly the dry leaves of bamboo? I lie on the ground and let the sun fall across my back as I've been doing for the past hour, listening to the distant traffic, to the calls of birds I cannot name. Once there was so much I thought I needed. Now all I know is that I want to get closer to it, the rocky slope the orange petals of the nasturtium adorning the fence, the wind's sudden breath, close enough that I can almost feel at night the slight pressure of the stars against my skin. Isn't this what the mystics meant when they spoke of forsaking the world? Not to turn our backs to it, only to its elaborate thoughts, its complicated pleasures, in favor of the pine's long shadow, the slow song of the grass. I'm always forgetting and remembering and forgetting. I want to leave something here in the rough dirt, a twig, a small stone, Perhaps this poem, a reminder to begin again by listening carefully with the body's rapt attention, remember, to this, to this. As we go forward, so thank you so much for coming today, really.